So I spent a little bit of time talking to you about why flaky tests are, are terrible for your, you know, your, your testing culture. And now I want to tell you how we can detect them. I want to note up front that I'm taking a JVM oriented approach today um, because I think that's what most of the audience here is interested in. Um, but many of the concepts apply to most sophisticated applications using mainstream tech, tech stacks. If you're using Swift or Go or you know, C++ or JavaScript or Ruby, um, lots of these things are, are common to most ecosystems. So we'll start by studying what makes tests themselves non-deterministic. So some common causes of test flakiness. You know, I've kind of, in some research that I've done in, you know, around the, the space, one thing that's really common is improper time handling, for example. Did you know that Java's system clock is non-monotonic? That means that if you call system.currentTimeMillies, it can go backwards. And then you're getting negative numbers for durations that you didn't expect, and you get flaky tests. Similarly, sometimes tests don't clean up the database tables or a file system correctly. Or during cleanup, there's an exception thrown and files are left there. There are also other types of resource leaks such as file handles or server connection leaks that can also cause flakiness. And finally, infrastructure is, can often be flaky such as external services, browser tests are also notoriously flaky, and even dynamic library dependencies. Before we move on, I wanna give you a quick poll. Now imagine that you get a a test build failure email, and you're sure you didn't break the tests. I would like to know what, what you do. You know, do you do nothing? Do you manually disable the test? Do you add a retry annotation perhaps? Or do you pretty much immediately try to fix the test yourself? All right, so I see that, you know, a good portion of folks are, are honest. Um, you know, nothing is what, what folks typically do. You know, when you encounter a flaky test, you get an email and you get, and you know, oftentimes you want to just ship your thing. Um, now, a lot of you said they try to fix the test right away, which is excellent, excellent behavior. Um, and at least if you don't fix it, you know, filing an issue is the next best, best thing. But you know, oftentimes flaky tests are really hard to fix. And so sometimes if you're trying to ship your thing, you'll say, okay, well, I'm just going to disable it. I'm going to file an issue or I will ignore it for now. At least, you know, folks know about it. So that's good. Those of you who responded that way, you're on the right track. But, you know, oftentimes, yeah, I've, I've just seen so many organizations that it's not the case where folks actually try to actively fix, you know, test failures that were not theirs. Yeah, ignoring the failure is what most engineers do, but obviously it's not going to mitigate the, the problem. If the change is really blocking you, you might temporarily disable it. You might even file an issue to fix it. Disabling the test will unblock you, but what you've done there is reduce test coverage and that your team will need in the future. Um, some teams use a JUnit retry or similar test framework mechanisms. Um, this is also likely to unblock you, but it's just as reactive as disabling the test because you have to make change for every flaky test you discover. And finally, other teams execute retries at the build level. This is more likely to prevent a blocked CI pipeline because it proactively retries newly introduced flaky tests but it's also a bit more dangerous because if your team does not track and fix flakiness, then that flakiness can run rampant. So um, a little bit later on, in a few minutes, I'll talk about tracking and fixing these flaky tests. I wanna quickly cover some common methods that folks I've found folks use to detect flakiness. So sometimes it's obvious to engineers, if you look at a test, um, test outputs, and you can see just from the exception type and message, ah, this is clearly, you know, flaky. If you see an uh, out of memory error, for example, you say, yeah, well, that's not going to happen most every test run, most likely. Some systems track git commits and they can mark a test as flaky if a test is executed in multiple builds against the same commit, but has different outcomes. More specialized systems can take a git patch and a fail test and determine whether or not the patch could have caused the test failure. So it would say, oh, well, if this patch is completely unrelated, you, you changed a readme, file and some test failed, then it, it, that's pr most likely going to be a, a, a flaky test. Most organizations that I've encountered run a test multiple times and compare the test outcomes. But finally, some try to guess at a flaking, they kind of have a flakiness factor. They compute by analyzing just the test outcome history, regardless of other factors. I'm going to explain, kind of dig into 
the, the flaws and, and good things about these. But first, you know, I want to know it's, it's really important that whatever detection method you employ, you avoid false positives as much as possible. And the reason is because if you end up having to investigate a whole lot of flaky tests that didn't turn out to be flaky, then you know, it's, they're, they're valid or for whatever reason, um, then you, you, you kind of get burned. And uh, you know what happens after that? You know, what happens if your flaky test, flaky test detection system is itself flaky is you ignore it just like you ignore flaky tests. So it's no better. So we can kind of eliminate some of the, the methods of detecting flakiness based on you know, trying to avoid false positives. Now, first of all, we can eliminate, I think, uh, analyzing test outcome history by itself because it's, it's just not reliable. You, if you don't know what changes are happening to the system, um, it's, it's, you're guaranteed to, to find cases where it's not going to work out. Multiple builds from the same Git SHA, they're not always sufficiently similar to reliably make a flaky determination. The reason is because machines themselves may have, if, if there's you know, a bad disk or a bad network configuration, those are the source of flakiness. Not really, not necessarily the test. The test just happens to be um, the thing that, that sounds the alarm. In my opinion, an ideal solution might be a combination of static analysis, stack trace parsing, and rerunning tests. But proving that a test failure is mutually exclusive to a given change set is really difficult to do reliably since teams and projects are highly diverse and always changing. Similarly, semantic analysis of exception types and messages is difficult to do broadly. So if you want an automated system that does natural language processing and says, oh, I've, I've, uh, I've discovered that this exception type and message um, you know, are, are causes for flakiness, you can only get so far. Um, you know, I'll tell you, even at Google and, and, and many other places, nearly every flaky test detection system I've come across has retrying tests in some form. Um, it's very simple for the engineers to understand, and its predictions are reliable.